Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Survey of Universal License Recognition Laws um, webinar about our report. Uh, my name is Caitlin Bison uh, from the Council of State Governments, and this webinar will present lessons learned from the report, um, important components of the Universal License Recognition Laws as well as the relationship between ULR policies and existing interstate compacts. Um, I would like to thank our incredible panel of speakers um, that will include in individuals representing the Federation of Associations of Regulatory Boards, the Council on Licensure Enforcement and Regulation, uh, Representative Greer of Missouri. Um, but before we get started, just wanted to draw your attention to a few housekeeping items. Um, next slide. Um, so this webinar will be recorded and available on our website. And by continuing to participate in the webinar, you are agreeing to be recorded. Um, to reduce noise during the presentations, all the participants will be muted. And if you have any questions for our panelists at the Q&A session at the very end, please submit them through the Q&A feature at the bottom. And if you have any technical difficulties or any questions about Zoom, please use the chat feature to type a question and CSG staff will get back to you as soon as possible. So without further delay, we'll get started with the webinar. Um, so I'm gonna start by giving an overview of the report that was released on Monday. Um, so this report was published on December 13th and um, I'll just give a bit about the methods and results that were outlined in it. Um, so to begin, the universal licensing recognition laws have been implemented or amended in about 20 states since 2018. And from those 20, CSG um, chose Arizona, Colorado, Idaho, Iowa, Missouri, Montana, and Pennsylvania, based on how long ago they had implemented the universal license recognition um, to give a survey to the licensing boards in those states. And Utah was not surveyed because it is reviewing the 2020 ULR law with a report to be published in 2022. And so a survey was sent out to representatives of licensing boards in these states to learn more on how ULR policies have contributed to changes in licensing in these states and the kind of experiences and challenges of implementing these policies. And also included in the appendix of the report are statements on ULR laws from CLEAR and FARB. And this report can be found at licensing.csg. publication. Next slide. Um, so the process of recognizing a license issued by another state, known as kind of licensure by endorsement or reciprocity, isn't a new concept but ULR policies apply these endorsements or reciprocity provisions on a wider scale, attempting to streamline the licensing process for practitioners moving into a state by establishing uniform license portability standards. And while reciprocity statutes contain pre-negotiated instantaneous recognition for professionals, ULR laws may require an additional application and review by the applicable licensing board before a license can be issued. Um, to prevent uneven qualifications with cur currently licensed individuals, many states specify that licenses will be granted for substantially equivalent or substantially similar experiences or scopes of practice. Um, and so many states also require that individuals establish residence in the state before obtaining a license through a ULR and most states surveyed exclude ULR professions covered under interstate licensure compacts. Um, so this table shows each state surveyed and highlights the important provisions that I just mentioned covering residency requirements, substantially equivalent determinations, and uh, interstate licensing compact exclusion. Next slide, please. Um, so with the methods of the survey, um, after sending it out, CSG collected 31 responses from licensing bodies from seven states, 16 of which were from state boards in Pennsylvania. And respondents were given a series of open-ended questions and one statement to be evaluated on a Likert scale. 
The questions assess staff member experiences with implementing ULR policy, challenges faced, unintended consequences, and whether the policy has positively contributed to the state's workforce. Respondents were also asked to discuss the impact of the policy on the state's ability to respond to the COVID-19 outbreak and any resulting workforce challenges. Next slide, please. Um, so you can see here's a, a chart of where respondents were asked to rate the following statement between strongly agree and strongly disagree. Uh, the statement, the universal recognition policy has positively contributed to my state's workforce. And 35% um, of respondents either agreed or strongly agreed that it has positively contributed to their state's workforce. However, 55% of the respondents were neutral. Next slide, please. Um, in response to the survey questions, many respondents noted the benefits that the ULR policies had provided them. Um, for them, these ULR policies can reduce barriers to licensure for out-of-state practitioners, require practitioners to abide by the scope of practice of the state in which they intend to practice, and allow for expedited movement of practitioners during emergencies. For states wanting to ease the process of licensing for out-of-state practitioners and gain workers in profession with labor shortages, ULR policies um, they believed also facilitated in filling those gaps. For example, one respondent noted that the ULR policy can help reduce unnecessary barriers for residents, veterans, military spouses, and other individuals who wish to move to and work in the state. And another believed that the policy enabled more practitioners to provide healthcare services during the pandemic. Um, we also wanted to note that it seems respondents from boards licensing occupations with a high level of standardization nationwide, um, found that the ULR policy kind of streamlined the licensing of out-of-state practitioners while avoiding some of the issues ULR policies cause for these less standardized occupations. Next slide, please. So with that, we'll move on to some of the concerns raised by respondents. One of the primary concerns was the lack of a need for a ULR roll off. Several um, respondents noted uh, existing reciprocity agreements and licensure by endorsement policies made an additional pathway for out-of-state practitioners unnecessary. For example, Rum respondent noted that the addition of a ULR law made applying for out-of-state license more confusing for applicants and difficult to manage for boards in a state with a residency requirement but respondents raised concerns that the ULR policy was not as easy or efficient as the previous endorsement process, making ULR more kind of challenging pathway for licensure app for applicants moving into the state. Um, another consistent concern raised by the respondents was that the application of um, substantially similar provisions in ULR policies. So several of them noted difficulty in procuring information to determine substantially similar requirements because definitions of occupations can sort of differ state to state. And one respondent was also concerned with differing scopes of practice and job titles creating disruptions in the process. Additionally, in one state that did not have a substantially similar requirement provision at all, um, several of the survey responses pointed out that the ULR policy allowed for licensing of out-of-state applicants with notably fewer requirements than those in-state. Um, there were also a few procedural concerns, noting a need for a new or improved online application and licensing process for the increased traffic from out-of-state practitioners. So next slide. So from this survey, CSG has noted a few lessons learned from the responses received. These lessons include the fact that ULR policies do allow states to reduce barriers to licensure for out-of-state professionals already licensed in another jurisdiction. However, the burden of implementation and use by practitioners could be eased through the inclusion of clear language to determine substantial equivalence digitized licensing systems and provisions to explicitly exclude interstate compacts, 
Um, so with that, I like to kind of give a short overview of the difference between ULR policies and interstate licensure compacts. Um, so as states have worked to reduce barriers to interstate mobility for licensed professionals, they have usually done so through these two different methods, the compacts and the license recognition laws. Um, so a sort of short definition for interstate licensure compacts is that they are statutorily enacted agreements among states allowing licensees to practice across state lines. And as of now, about 42 states have enacted at least one interstate licensure compact and 29 states belong to at least three interstate licensure compacts. As for universal license recognition laws, they are where a single state determines its unique process to grant a license by endorsement to a license holder from another state or territory. And as I mentioned before, since 2018, 20 states have either amended or enacted universal recognition for out-of-state work, licensed workers. Um, next slide. Um, so this table shows some similarities and differences between universal recognition laws and interstate compacts. Um, so you can see from the check marks and X's that while both methods require practitioners to abide by scope of practice in the new jurisdiction and allow for expedited movement of practitioners during emergencies, and they also reduce barriers for out-of-state practitioners, um, universal license laws do not reduce, I think it says reduce barriers for in-state practitioners looking for to practice in multiple states, um, gather a coalition of states to establish uniform licensure standards, or create a multi-state database of licensure information to facilitate investigations, as well as a few others. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed that and gained a little bit of knowledge from that short overview of the report and summary of you know, ULR policies versus interstate compacts. Um, but I will now turn it over to our first guest speaker, um, Corey Everett Miskell from um, CLEAR. Uh, so just to give a short introduction, uh, Corey is a past president and former board member for the Council on Licensure Enforcement and Regulation or an organization dedicated to regulatory excellence in occupational licensing. She was also a former deputy director with the Colorado Department of Regulatory Agencies where she oversaw nearly 200,000 licensees in healthcare and professional service sectors. Currently, she serves as Colorado Director for the Latino Co Coalition for Community Leadership, where she helps state agencies meaningfully connect to communities through credentialing and workforce development for marginalized populations, include, including those experiencing poverty, former incarceration, and that are victims of crime. And I'd just like to introduce her. You can, it's your turn. Great, thank you so much, Caitlin. And thank you to CSG for putting this together. I think both on the publication as well as the webinar. It's so nice to like take a lunch hour, just kind of like dive deeply into a particular policy area. So yes, um, I, I think Caitlin already introduced me. So a little bit about CLEAR, we're um, really dedicated to regulatory excellence. We do that through educational forums, conferences, um, other training programs really to help regulators, board members, or other stakeholders that are associated with occupational licensing um, to really talk about what are best practices, innovations within the field, and, and how to really preserve quality as, as a regulator. Um, so one of the kind of hallmarks of CLEAR is that we are a neutral body, so we will not take policy or uh, positions or positions on particular policy matters. Um, rather, we're really wanting to like kind of bring together folks to really talk about those merits and unintended consequences. Um, so we have members from across the world. Um, about a third of our membership is in the United States um, and then also joined by our Canadian colleagues and then members from across the world in Europe um, and Australia, Asia area. area. So um, the ULR policies, I think, have been a really hot topic for our regulators and our members, um, especially since some of the Arizona um, license rampart legislation was really passed that Caitlin's already talked a little bit about some of those policies. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide, if that's possible. Um, I want to talk briefly about, um, sorry, 
Can we go, is it possible to go to the next slide? I'm not seeing it change on my slide. I'm going to keep barreling ahead. So if you if you want to just jump to the portability and access slide, I'm going to dive right in there. Um, so ULR, ULR policies have really been a hot topic, as I mentioned. Um, and I think that sometimes those are born from some frustration with the process of moving a license across state lines. And policymakers rightly observe that it can be cumbersome and it really affects, um, has this effect of limiting the number of competent practitioners that are in the market, whether they're electricians or nurses um, or countless other professions. So with too much restriction, the consumer really lacks access to qualified individuals that affect their home, their health, and ultimately the economy. Um, and with re a restricted pool, you can also see um, prices continue to rise that are passed on to consumers or innovation that really stagnates. Ah, oh, here we're getting into some. Some slides. I'm going to keep going. Um, so this can really be concerning, um, I think, during normal times, um, so to speak, but can quickly become a crisis, especially during like a public health emergency or a natural disaster. Um, and actually one slide before this would be perfect. Um, and so I do want to highlight that in such like an emergency situations like that, like a public health emergency, like we're all too familiar with at this point, but also very importantly, natural disasters, um, that regulatory boards have specialized provisions to quickly and safely open, open the state to qualified out-of-state practitioners. And I think that's really important. There are some mechanisms to do that um, that are maybe a little bit different than the policies that we utilize in that steady state. So I'm really going to take today to speak to that steady state of policy um, rather than like what's happening in those emergency situations, which are a little different. Um, so really the policy question that we're considering with ULR is how do we facilitate portability to license in order to bolster or ensure access to care and services? So with that, I'll go to the next slide. And here I want to talk about really a menu of options. So when we pose this question to our regulatory community, we really understood there's a spectrum of policy options depending on the particular matter that you're really seeking to resolve. Um, so Caitlin already talked about you know, ULR policies and some of its merits. Of course, they address a multitude of professions and intend to lower that threshold to license portability and really um, reduce the time to licensure for folks that are coming from out of state. Um, that's kind of like a systemic policy approach, right? It affects everybody. So there are some other mechanisms um, that operate a bit more like a scalpel to address individual um, concerns about access. So consider, for example, a border region. We know that communities and economies easily span borders. Um, borders can feel a little bit arbitrary in those areas, right? People living and working in those areas tend to float across state lines for basic goods and services and, and to work, right? Um, in such a case, a reciprocity agreement is a really effective tool. Um, so this is basically an agreement that one state issues with another state says, hey, you take our licensees, we'll take yours, and you don't actually have to apply. You can just, we're just going to acknowledge that at an administrative level. So it works awesome for like regional economies. Where it doesn't work great is any state that's kind of like outside of that region and any worker that might be coming from outside of that regional economy. So something to kind of bear in mind for sure. Um, COVID, I think, really put this um, telehealth or telepractice on steroids. Really, like this was already being developed before COVID, but then once we all kind of went into lockdown, I think we really had to very quickly innovate our policies and how we practice. And for regulators, that was a concern to think about, well, how can we allow for this innovation and also ensure that practice and quality are still safe for the consumer? Um, so, so with telehealth, I think importantly, you know, telepractice is more than just telehealth. Uh, for example, the ability to pass a plumbing inspection utilizing synchronous communication. Those are just some of the innovations that we're starting to see within the field. Telepractice or, or telehealth is really effective at transporting a specialist into an area that has a depressed supply of practitioners. Um, so especially for like rural areas. So you may not have like um, a, a particular like specialized physician that is going to go practice in a rural area because there's just not enough demand 
from the patient community, but those patients may still occasionally need that service. And so telehealth allows them to provide access to care. Um, and I think that's very important. It can provide access to care across state lines. Um, and so there are regulations associated with that. And that's really important, I think, as you're considering some states, um, we, we deal with this in my home state of Colorado, we tend to have um, bigger uh, uh, metro areas and just kind of like a bigger population. So we tend to be a donor state, whereas um, you know our neighbor to the north, Wyoming, doesn't have a huge population, so may not have the same level of specialists or supply of specialists where telehealth might become really um, helpful. Compacts, I think, you know, it, it, as Caitlin already reviewed, they really do offer perhaps the most streamlined mechanism for licensed mobility. Um, however, they only affect one profession at a time, and it can take years to design and implement a compact. And so it's kind of clunky for that reason, right? Um, and here it's really important, I think, for policymakers to understand that not all compacts are designed equally. For example, the physician compact, um, the interstate medical um, licensure compact, um, defines the location of practice according to where the patient is located, not according to where the physician is located. And that's different than the nurse licensure compact that defines the location of practice to be where the nurse is located. So wherever uh, that nurse is traveling is where the location of practice is occurring. So that may seem like kind of like a benign um, difference, but it has some really important consequences and outcomes. For example, with the physician compact, a physician gets an expedited process, but still has to seek licensure in every state in which she really desires to practice. Whereas with the nurse compact, you apply once, you get one license in your home state where you originated, right? And then you don't have to go administratively apply in these other states in order to practice. So that does tend to be a little bit more streamlined, again, de depending on where you define that location of practice. Um, some other mechanisms that really help streamline licensing include the use of temporary licenses or grace periods. Um, often we've seen the regulatory community kind of like test these policies on military spouses, um, which is how we've seen kind of this progression towards ULR policies. Um, but these, these are policies that basically allow a grace period, right? Notice, knowing that the licensure or application process takes some time, um, that they have you know, the ability to get to work while they wait for that process to resolve itself. Um, we asked our members um, at CLEAR kind of what's the next big policy innovation you really see for license portability. And many folks quickly pointed out this evolution of our our mechanisms here to create a circumstance similar to a driver's license in which you know one license is issued in one single state but it's acknowledged as legitimate in every other state without an administrative application process um, so without even like some of these ULR policies where you have to evaluate substantial equivalence and apply and let them know you're in the state and all of those things um, so that's a tall order. I don't know. Um, Utah has the has kind of taken the first stab there, um, and they have some interesting legislation, which is noted in the publication uh, that CSG put forward. So going to the last slide or the next slide here, um, Clear does have a publication um, that really or a, a resource that we published, um, especially for policymakers, called "Questions a Legislator Should Ask." So the resource really seeks to provide a number of considerations that would be weighed when drafting new legislation or changing statutes. So some of the questions that seem applicable to this particular topic of ULR policies and license portability include some that are on the screen here. So um, what is the problem that could be solved by the policy? What previous efforts have been made to address the problem? What is the public benefit to the proposed policy? What does the public need to know about a licensed professional and how, they, how will they be informed? Um, and then would the proposed regulation unfairly disadvantage special populations? I am a big fan of always looking at also not just what are we changing with our policies, there are other changes we can make that maybe reduce the regulatory footprint and streamline things without ever touching a state law. Um, so simply upgrading our technology and looking at our workflows can really reduce that time to licensure without actually adopting any type of policy. So I think that that spectrum and that kind of menu of options is very important to consider as you're looking at what's the issue we're really trying to resolve. 
Um, so next slide. Um, with that, um, I will go ahead and pass it over to my colleague Veronica Meadows over at FARB. Um, and I'm definitely here, you know, sticking around to help answer any questions that might come up towards the end of our hour together. So thank you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Corey. Um, also, sorry about the technical difficulties at the very beginning, but it's still a wonderful presentation. Um, we will now hear from Veronica Meadows, as she mentioned. Um, so to give a short introduction, uh, Veronica is the Chief Strategy, Chief Strategy Officer for the Council of Landscape Architectural Registration Boards. Um, she is responsible for the management and refinement of CLARB, C-L-A-R-B, <laughs> strategy system in addition to oversight of the organization's government, membership, communication, and advocacy functions to promote stakeholder engagement and empower partners to defend common sense regulation and licensure of landscape architecture. Her career in association management spans over 20 years and includes experience in marketing, communication, customer and public relations, strategic planning, leadership development, and strategic government systems. Um, she also serves as a member at large on the executive board of FARB and is a certified associate, association executive. So thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank you uh, to CSG for having me today. Um, as was mentioned, I'm here today as an executive, a board member for the Federation of Association of Regulatory Boards. Um, like uh, Corey and Clear, uh, Farb was also asked to contribute to the CSG study. And I just wanted to uh, participate today to share our comments and um, some of the perspectives from the broader regulatory community. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so just to tell you a little bit about FARB, um, the Federation of Associations of Regulatory Boards is comprised of national regulatory associations and jurisdictional licensing boards across the country. Um, similarly to CLEAR, we do exist to advance excellence in regulation of professions in the interest of public protection. Um, we do this by providing education and training to the regulatory community, um, facilitating knowledge and information sharing, and the development of regulatory best practices and resources. Next slide. Um, just to share a little bit about uh, FARB members, our members represent over 30 regulated professions and over 12 million licensees across the country. And this includes professions within medicine, within technical professions like uh, architecture, engineering, landscape architecture, and others. Um, and our membership is really made up of, of several different categories. Um, we have the, as I mentioned, the National Associations of Regulatory Boards, whose role is to really work with the individual states within our memberships um, to establish uniform standards for education, experience, and examination. Um, FARB also has individual licensure board members or state agencies as members and legal counsel for regulatory boards across the country. Um, in addition, we also have a few members that represent uh, companies that provide services to state agencies and licensure boards. Um, now I'd like to take you through uh, some of the input uh, that FARB provided to the CSG study. And I think first and foremost, uh, we want to start out by saying that FARB supports um, consistency and licensure requirements across jurisdictions. Um, and many of our members, the national regulatory associations, are working um, at, you know, to ensure there is greater consistency. Because I think we all agree that um, reform, when done correctly, is, is a good thing. Um, to help reduce those barriers or that friction in the licensure process that really doesn't uh, have a direct uh, public protection outcome. Um, but I think where we uh, would urge policymakers and legislators to um, maybe have a, a little caution is, you know, many of the professions that are regulated already have 
uh, national mobility models uh, that work really well. Corey did a great job of kind of talking about the range of options that exist out there. Um, and sometimes the URL policies that get implemented don't really take those existing uh, models into consideration and ultimately end up adding in, as we saw from the CSG study results, adding some additional bureaucracy and confusion that, um, you know, that maybe was an unintended consequence of that policy. Um, the other thing that we've recognized, and I think we saw in this study as well, is the URL policies are being implemented a little differently from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. I mean, as we know, uh, according to the 10th Amendment, the states have the right to protect their citizens in the way um, that they feel most appropriate, um, which does create kind of inconsistency in the way these policies are implemented from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, I think the other piece too, and, and, and Caitlin mentioned this in, in her uh, discussion, and I, I think Corey uh, touched on it as well, is you know the substantial equivalency determination in, in, in many cases is poorly defined or you know doesn't resonate or provide consistency from, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, you know, I think that, you know, we would just uh, share with the, um, with policymakers and, and legislators across the country that, you know, there are many uh, uh, organizations, FARB itself and our members within FARB, you know, we really exist and have been uh, working on and in in implementing mobility models for you know, over a hundred years collectively. And we would encourage policymakers to reach out to us as um, subject matter experts and partners in establishing um, new licensure mobility policies. Um, you know, another uh, issue that we we sometimes see with the, the, the uh, URL policies that have been implemented and, and Caitlin alluded to this in, in her checklist, um, is it doesn't necessarily take into account, at least for landscape architecture, and I'll, I'll use our profession as an example, um, our licensees in many cases, at least 50% of them are licensed in multiple jurisdictions. And so if you don't intend to live in the, the, the jurisdiction where you practice, um, that can create the URL uh, policies does create, or it doesn't address that issue necessarily. Um, so I guess the, I'll close with, um, you know, FARB and the regulatory uh, community uh, within FARB, you know, we do strive to inform uh, public policy discussions regarding licensure mobility. We'd love to serve as a resource um, and uh, just would uh, encourage that policymakers, uh, you know, reach out and, and utilize uh, those of us that have been doing this for quite some time as a resource in, in development of new, new public policy around licensure mobility. And with that, I will hand it over to the representative. Hey, thank, thank you. you so much. Um, great, great opportunity to be here to talk um, a little bit about our experience in Missouri with universal license recognition um, and our just kind of a perspective from a legislator's view as to why the policy was appealing um, and what, uh, what it has done for our state. Uh, and what it is doing in, in other states as well. Um, so in Missouri, I chair the Economic Development Committee uh, and uh, have been involved uh, pretty heavily with workforce development and looking for ways really to, to bring skilled workers to the state of Missouri. We have, uh, over the past several years, had a number of uh, you know, job openings, lots of jobs, but we don't have the skilled workers to fill those jobs. Um, very consistent problem across the state um, as I went around and, and the first year that I had the opportunity to chair the committee uh, three years ago, um, I took a tour of Missouri and talked to a lot of businesses um, and, and organizations throughout the state. And that was a consistent theme was, you know, we need to find ways to, to get the skilled workers here to make it easier for people that want to work to get to work. Um, and as many of you on this call probably already know, one in every four professions requires a license or permission from the government to work. Uh, and it's grown exponentially over the last several decades. It used to be just 40 or 50 years ago, it was one in every 20 or 30 professions required a license. So we, we have become um, uh, much stricter in our regulation and uh, the, the uh, amount of regulation has, has increased uh, quite substantially. So 
in Missouri, we spend a lot of money on, uh, at just like every state, on incentives um, to, to bring workers here, to bring jobs here. We spend millions and millions and millions and millions of, job, of, of dollars to, to try and find people to fill the jobs that we have and to bring businesses and people here. So when we were looking at what way, in what way can we encourage more business here, in what ways can we grow our workforce here, one of the logical ways to do that was to make it easier for people to take their skills from other states and come to Missouri where we have jobs and where we need those jobs filled. And of course, occupational licensing is one um, clear way that we could break some of the barriers down to entry um, and make it easier for people to come here and work. Uh, three years ago, we passed, uh, I was able to pass a bill that um, created universal license rec recognition um, with substantially similar standards. So that was the way that we got things started. And military license reciprocity was just before that. So we passed those kind of the same year um, and the military license recognition went through kind of at the same time. And so we were able to parallel that. The next year, after Arizona had passed their full universal license recognition, which was the most comprehensive in the country, um, I had an opportunity to meet with Governor Ducey at the time and a number of the folks that had been involved in that effort. Um, and I fell in love with it because I knew that it was a problem in talking to a lot of people that have moved to our state, um, that a lot of these licenses are not as easy as it should be to, to come to Missouri to work uh, and to use that, that skill that you have and that you have been practicing in many cases for years and years um, with, with a solid record um, of public health and safety and all those things. So it just made sense that if, if you're practicing in another state and you, you are in good standing with that state and it's good enough for another state, it should be good enough for Missouri. Um, and I know there's some, some differences of opinion on that. Um, a lot of the regulatory boards and the people that are in the industries, they feel like, well, Missouri knows best, or Colorado knows best, or Arkansas knows best, and we should set our own standards of practice. Well, I got to tell you, the, the skills that are needed to be a, co in a, co a cosmetologist in Florida or Wisconsin or California, they don't really change very much state to state. Same thing goes with CPAs, same thing goes with, um, you know, somebody who's in a healthcare profession. Those skills um, are transferable. And so we shouldn't make it more difficult for people from another state to come to Missouri and to use those skills to fill jobs that we have. So that was the approach that we took. We said, okay, this is something that, that can break down barriers to entry, that can solve a lot of the problems, and it's, it's not going to cost us a dime. We can just change our policy and that's gonna attract more workers to our state. So we set about the hard work and I'll, I'll just kind of describe the process to you. Um, as many of you I know are not legislators and may not have been involved in the process. I'll just describe kind of what that looks like uh, to take a bill from start to finish. Um, once we got the kind of the idea, right? And we'd seen the policy modeled in Arizona. Um, we said, okay, how do we make this right for Missouri? Because there's going to be some, some minor adjustments and, and modifications to fit how we do things here in Missouri. So how do we do that? So we got some other kind of national think tanks involved, FGA, the Foundation for Government Accountability, um, the Knee Institute. I mean, the list was, was, was long of people that I personally engaged as a legislator, uh, as someone who wanted to get this policy um, addressed and talked about and discussed and passed. Um, wanted to get their input on it. And then we also took it to some of the Missouri specific organizations that had some experience with this. Um, and then we started talking to some of the industry professionals and some of the, the regulatory bodies that would be involved in this um, to figure out what the right path was. And we came up with the right, the right policy. And then uh, as the legislator who was gonna be sponsoring the bill, um, I worked on getting buy-in from some of the key stakeholders. So we went to the Speaker of the House, we went to the Governor, we talked to some of these folks and approached them with, uh, you know, with the idea and what it could do, how it could improve, um, how things are being done in Missouri. And thankfully, they all really liked it. They thought this was a great opportunity for us. Um, also to be said, great bipartisan support. Uh, when we finally did pass this through the Senate, uh, started in the House, went through to the Senate, we had unanimous support for it, which almost never happens in politics, right? 
But we had all senators, Democrat and Republican, together on this being a solid, good solution for Missouri. And I think it's proven to be just that over the last two years or so since we passed it. Um, so through the legislative process, we got buy-in. We had a lot of these national organizations were willing to come and testify and talk about um, their experience with this policy, talk about how it's impacted other states, the positive things that it's doing, um, and the, the individual lives that it's impacted, right? And also address a lot of the concerns. Um, some of the concerns that were kind of briefly mentioned here, you know, of, you know, standards and um, quality of care wasn't specifically mentioned, but that's often an objection that comes up that, you know, how can we be sure we're protecting the public here? And that's often a, um, a reasoning and justification between more burdensome regulations. We need to protect the public. Well, a lot of times if we if you get deep into that and you look at, OK, where are the specific instances where there has been a risk to the public health or safety by broadening some of these standards, um, by allowing people to transfer their licenses from state to state, you see very, very few, if any, in many cases, examples of that. Um, so that was very important for legislators to understand that and to see that. Um, so we, we walked through that process um, and we got to the point where in the Senate, we had a clean bill from start to finish all the way up until we got to the floor of the Senate. And we ran into some challenges there. Um, and I guess before that, what we had done to help broaden support was we added some other So people that have been incarcerated when they're getting out of prison, it allows them the opportunity to pursue many careers that have been uh, out of bounds for them before. Um, if it's a nonviolent crime, if it does not apply specifically to that license um, that they're seeking to get, um, they can't be prohibited from, from getting a license in those fields, uh, which only makes sense. We want people that are coming out of prison to be productive members of society. We always talk about um, them, you know, engaging in society and working, wanting to put them to work and get them, um, you know, the, 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 the participation in the workforce. Well, if three or one out of every four professions require government permission and they're denying the ability for those incarcerated, formerly incarcerated people to get those licenses. Well, we're really making it hard for them, especially since most of those one in four professions that require a license are, um, are uh, lower income jobs. So, you know, and those are typically the jobs that people coming out of prison are going to be looking for. So we had, again, that was a way that we were able to get really, really strong bipartisan support for um, and the senator who was the sponsor of that bill in uh, in the Senate, the Fresh Start Act, uh, a Democrat, was willing to, uh, to to bring that and attach that to our bill. We also added on the Expanded Apprenticeships Act, um, which is another great policy, great way to help encourage work in our state. So we married all three of them up and we went through. And there was also a lot of opportunity here to address some of the concerns that had been for years and years and years used to scare legislators into not making the policy decision to move forward with this, um, in that it would be a hazard to the safety and health of, of Missourians to allow people to come from other states. Well, we had this thing called COVID, and we had to knock down a lot of these barriers to entry. Um, specifically for the healthcare professions. We needed healthcare workers in Missouri. We needed nurses uh, and other healthcare pr practitioners and professionals in Missouri to address some of the needs that we had here. And by breaking down those barriers to entry, we were able to bring them here and not go through all of the, the hoops and all of the challenges and the time that it took to get those licenses or be able to, to practice here um, you know, we were able to do that by loosening those, those regulations. Well, if it works during a pandemic, it works all the time. And the arguments against the safety and health concerns that so many people have parroted for years and years, we were able to show over the last year, hey, guys, look, this is, this is not happening. You always have talked about how, you know, we should be scared that if we let these standards down and we let people from other states come in that may not have the exact same requirements that we do for, for their licenses, that 
our public in Missouri is going to be at risk. Well, it didn't happen. There aren't any examples of people that had licenses in other states coming to Missouri and practicing that caused problems for Missourians. So it works. And so now a lot of those objections, um, it's very easy to overcome them by showing the example that we've had over the last couple of years. So we, we ended up passing the bill, um, signed it into law, and now the, you know, the challenge is uh, execution and implementation. And as a legislator, I've taken a very direct role um, with our boards and engaging with them and, and making sure that, that there aren't any challenges that we need to address with it, um, because it has been rel a relatively new um, policy. So how do we make sure that the word is getting out to people? How do we eliminate some of the challenges that were mentioned here of, you know, the uh, confusion of, well, you know, how do I apply for a license? Does universal license recognition apply to me? Letting people know that, yes, it does apply to you um, and, and making sure that our boards uh, and the department are, are publicizing that this is something that is in fact available to people so that um, they can avoid going through a lot of the, the stress and strain and, and challenges that, um, that were there previously. Um, so I think that's a, that's a big part of this, uh, you know, and a lot of legislators forget that. Um, once you pass a law, it doesn't mean that the department um, or the, you know, the bureaucracy is gonna really work to help that policy be put into place. So it, it takes some real, um, some, some work and, and some collaboration to do that and to make sure that, um, that we address those things. Um, so, you know, it, there's a, a number of other ways to address the idea of license mobility, I guess. Um, and one of them was mentioned with the compacts and um, the interstate compacts. Um, and that's something that we've had to keep a close eye on in Missouri, honestly, um, because it, 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 if the wording isn't right, with a compact and you adopt a compact after you've adopted a ULR policy, oftentimes those, those compacts can kind of override the ULR. And so the ULR is the most broad. I mean, that is gonna do the most for breaking down barriers to entry. It is gonna do the most for workforce development. It is going to help your states more than any of these other policies will do, in my humble opinion, at least for people coming to your state. Um, it does not address professionals from your state going to other states. Um, and that's why I believe all states should adopt a ULR policy. And then we won't need to have these conversations. If I'm licensed in Hawaii and I moved to Missouri, I should be able to get to work right away. It, there, there, there are very few professions where from state to state, um, it matters where you got trained and how you got trained. Um, they're very, very, very similar across the United States. Um, and in fact, we're looking at some other countries that have very, very similar standards that we do here and finding ways to encourage that collaboration across not just state lines, but across country lines too. Because if there's a skilled professional from another country that could come and fill a job here that's much needed, like for instance, physicians in rural areas, if we can ensure that somebody coming from the UK has been trained on a similar, with similar standards that we have here, why shouldn't we let them come and fill the jobs in rural America where there is a shortage of physicians, a shortage of healthcare professionals? So we're looking at ways to do that. Um, my point with the interstate compacts is simply that um, they have to be done correctly. Um, and and um, I think it's important to make sure they don't conflict with the ULR policy that's in place. Um, so we have, we have um, been willing to collaborate and add some of these interstate compacts after the ULR went into place. Um, but there have been a few that have attempted to usurp that UOR that we had to say no to um, until they changed the language such that it would not prohibit um, that, that exchange of mobility of people coming to Missouri. So um, few, I'm trying to think of a few other things here. I know you want to get to questions, though, so maybe I should, I should pause there um, and, and turn it back over to you, Caitlin. Um, to let folks ask some questions if they have any of all of us. And I appreciate the opportunity to be with you all. I really do. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. That's great. Um, so as you mentioned, we'll now have a short kind of Q&A session. So any um, and all questions, um, please submit in the Q&A feature at the bottom. Um, and I think we have a few already. 
Um, and the first, I think, is a bit specific to the report, but maybe if any of you all also have um, some insight, uh, feel free to address it. So um, Anne Ryman asked, um, can you address whether any concerns have arisen over requirements being different for in-state applicants than out-of-state out out applicants um, that are coming um, from having fewer education training or testing requirements? And um, from the report, at least, um, just as an example, one of the respondents noted that the board's scope of practice for specifically for funeral directors was different from other states and that the ULR policy kind of allowed um, practitioners to be licensed um, for which the education requirement um, was not the same and some of the operations they might not been familiar with. Um, so that's a very specific example. Um, I believe most of the other responses um, from the report were very general about um, having fewer education training or texting requirements. Um, but did any of the other speakers have anything to add to that question at all? Yeah, Caitlin, I can jump in there. I think this is exactly kind of the rub, right, as, it, as we talk about license portability. And I think something that also characterized kind of the endorsement and reciprocity processes, which were kind of the predecessor policies to universal licensure recognition. And I think what I've seen in the various different forms of legislation that have been passed for ULR is they're still kind of calibrating and trying to kind of resolve this particular issue. But the burden on the regulator can be, can be very difficult, right? And so that scope of practice issue is consider that example in which like, say in, in my state, this particular profession can, um, can, can issue injections. But in the state where this person is coming from, that scope of practice doesn't include injections. And so their education never covered how to perform an injection safely, cleaning and disinfecting standards, infection control, all of those things. So now you have an issue where you, if you're moving from a restricted scope to a broader scope, the educational requirements didn't address that and the sufficient patient safety concerns in order to practice with this bigger scope. Um, and so now you multiply that assessment across hundreds of license types and 50 states. And remember that legislation could change those requirements on basically an annual basis. You get into this kind of administrative burden of having to know exactly what every other state requires, what their scope is, if that's acceptable and substantially equivalent or not, that can be a pretty big headache. Um, and so I think ULR is still kind of trying to figure out again, how do we calibrate to really solve that issue? Um, I do want to point out there are private certifications and federations of, of boards like FARB um, uh, and CLARB that kind of help to coalesce and provide transparency about what those scopes are and um, what the requirements are in each state. And their services are incredibly helpful to regulators as they're really trying to undertake that substantial equivalence evaluation. The other that I think we've seen is, are there other policy tools we could use to cover the gap? Instead of just being an outright no, can we say, hey, why don't you go take a course just on injections and then come back? We're not gonna make you go start again at square one. Okay, thank you so much for that answer. Um, I think we also had another one uh, from Anne specifically for the representative. Um, uh, she asked, do we know how many universal licenses have been granted in Missouri so far and how many denials? And then if you could speak to how your bill may be different from Arizona's. Yeah, happy to. I'll, ju I'll just the last part of the question first. Um, the way that our uh, bill differs from Arizona's is that Arizona um, required a residency. Um, we looked at the, the composition of our state. We have two cities that are border cities, Kansas City and St. Louis. Um, and for us, it didn't make sense to have a, um, a, a residency requirement. So we eliminated the residency requirement, which then made it uh, the most comprehensive universal license recognition um, that had been passed in the entire country. Um, and my understanding is that we have had hundreds of uh, applications that have been approved. The last time I checked, um, there had been hundreds of professionals that had utilized it. Um, it was getting close to the thousand mark. Um, in terms of denials, I, I'm not aware of any that have been denied. 
Um, so I, I would have to check in with them again. It's been a couple months since we, since we spoke on that, but so far it was, it was being utilized. Um, and it was, it was working exactly the way that, that we intended it to. Thank you so much. Um, let me see. For the next question, um, Cheryl asked, um, during the discussions around ULR laws, have there been any discussions about the portability of education such that a post-secondary student in one state can complete a post-secondary curriculum in one state to bring their education to their state of choice to sit for an exam for a license, that sort of thing? Um, I am not aware of any, but I was wondering if the rest of the speakers know about um, such a question. I can speak to what I know. It would be a great idea. Oh, go ahead. I said no, but you just gave me an <laughs> idea. I said on both the education <laughs> committees in, Saint, in Missouri, so we'll look into that. I love that idea. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I can speak to the specificity around the licensure requirements for landscape architecture. And in most cases, it's looking for the degree type, not specific to the institution. So the uniform standard for licensure of landscape architects looks, like I said, specifically at the degree type, not the specific um, uh, institution. And, and I don't know of many professions, quite frankly, that look at it from the institute at the institution level, um, at least not, not in, my, in my understanding of, of the requirements across many professions that we see within FARB. Yeah, and, and I can piggyback on that. I think that where you see the, um, cause I like the second part of this question, which is, you know, we've seen um, that curriculum at post-secondary institutions in one state may not be sufficient to meet educational requirements and sit for the exam. And so the way that Veronica just described it, like that's ideal, right? But where it doesn't work is some of these other professions that use private occupational educational programs that aren't like, like degree requirements that are regulated by the Department of Education that are like acknowledged by state departments of education. Um, and so these private, so, so we, where you have professions with very disparate outcomes, the educational programs grow up in the state that address specifically that state's requirements and therefore are completely different than what you might find in another state. Right, and so um, some of these are like cosmetology programs, massage therapy. We see a really big kind of like um, spectrum of requirements for those, which is what's giving rise to these various educational programs. Um, so I think that is an issue that maybe is a strength for URL policies, because in those circumstances, you know, in a normal circumstance, you would have to go to every single board to evaluate that and look at it, how open are they to educational requirements from other states or educational programs for other states. And you would have to then like, if, you know, calibrate the licensing to or the statutes to every single board. Whereas URL policies um, or ULR policies really allow you to kind of just set this standard. And then all the boards just have to evaluate their regulations and conform to that standard. So it's, a, it's kind of an elegant policy initiative for that reason. Okay, great. Thank you so much for those answers. Um, we have just a few more minutes, so I'm gonna to get to a couple more questions that we can. Um, there was one from Donald that I believe may be for the representative. Um, they asked specifically, has there been an objection based on the legislative authority of one state being unconstitutionally delegated to another state or to a body consisting of several states? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand that question um, because Missouri, if under Missouri law, we are saying that another state's requirements uh, are good enough for us and uh, that if they have been in good standing with that state for and practicing for at least a year or more, I mean, those are our standards then, right? We're saying whatever you have in place is good enough as long as you've been there practicing for a year and are in good standing. Um, I, I haven't heard of any challenges like that. Um, so I, I think that's the answer is no, I, I have not. I think I think that, that uh, would have been the case, but um, I think Donald, if that didn't answer your question physically, please feel free to put another one. Um, and then I believe the last one is from Holly who asked, 
uh, where um, there is the most pushback. I believe that maybe um, in terms of states, um, I like I mentioned in the report from the respondents, it seems that uh, licensing bodies that license occupations that are less standardized across the nation um, seem to have um, more of these issues, whereas the process is a bit more streamlined for those occupations that already have um, this kind of uniform standards. Um, so I believe that would be my answer. I'm not entirely sure in terms of maybe um, if they meant states or um, anything else. So if there's anything uh, to add from the rest of the speakers. Yeah, I mean, I can I can speak to the opposition that we had in Missouri. Um, you know, I think where there is more agreement across state lines already, like within the industry of what the standards ought to be, CPAs are a great example, right? Um, most states say, you know, as long as you meet the standards of what it takes to be a CPA, then we're going to grant you a license to do that activity here. Um, and there's lots of other, you know, examples like that. And frankly, I love it when that's the case, um, when the industry kind of figures out what is right for them as a whole, and then they come up with a standard of, of practice. I think that's wonderful. Um, you know, so I, I think that's, you know, probably, probably the answer there. Okay, and with that, it looks like we are about a minute over. Um, so I'll just uh, wrap it up here and say thank you to all of our speakers and participants for your time and sharing your insights um, with great ideas to take home to the participants in their states and communities. Um, just want to say that the report, recording, webinar, and other information can be found at licensing.csg.org. And if you have any questions or would like to connect further, please contact any of us here and just don't hesitate to reach out. So I hope everyone has enjoyed this and has a great afternoon.